So uh, what I want to talk about is the relationship between digital transformation and AI, which is something that's sort of been implicit and glossed over. Uh, I think this might be a great way to end the morning because I'm going to uh, probably repeat a number of things that have been said in the previous panels, but sort of tie them together in a slightly different way. So I should start by explaining who I am, uh, because that's going to feed a little bit into my story here. So uh, my name is Mark Schwartz. I'm an enterprise strategist with AWS. What is an enterprise strategist, you ask? Um, I'm part of a, a small team of former C-suite executives of large enterprises. All of us did some sort of a digital transformation in our previous roles. All of us learned some good lessons on what it takes to actually accomplish it. And so we spend our time with senior leaders of organizations to try to help them deal with things, what turns out to be hard, right? The, the things like cultural change and organizational structure and governance models, investment strategies, business cases, uh, bureaucracy, my favorite topic. Um, and we speak at conferences, we write a lot. I've published five books on IT leadership and digital transformation. Uh, and my, my background, a uh, little bit different from the others perhaps, before I joined AWS, I was the CIO of US Citizenship and Immigration Services in the Department of Homeland Security. So uh, if any of you have ever tried to get a green card, uh, I apologize. Uh, that was us. Um, big, big stodgy government agency, part of Homeland Security, and even bigger stodgier government agency. Um, and uh, that was my only time in government. Before that, I was CIO of a company in San Francisco. I was CEO of a small software company. But it's, it's the government experience that, that was uh, the real learning opportunity for me, I would say. So uh, how did I wind up going into the government? Well, I was reading something about how messed up uh, government IT is. I was, must have been reading a newspaper article or something. And being the very modest person that I am, I immediately said, well, I could fix that. Um, so uh, I'm happy to announce to all of you that, yep, we fixed government IT. Everything's running like clockwork now. The uh, transformation we did, and it was a pretty big one, it started actually one day when I was watching television. Um, I was watching the news, and President Obama came on the news, and he, uh, he announced this thing he was gonna launch called DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, uh, which turned out to be his kind of signature immigration uh, policy. And he announced that it was going to be rolled out in 60 days. Now, um, this was a, a shock to me because uh, it was my people who were going to have to roll it out. And this was the first I'd heard of it. And there were a few things that I knew that the president didn't know that he might have wanted to know. And one of them was that our average time to make a change to an IT system, any change to any system, our release cycle time, essentially, was 18 months on the average. Uh, another thing he didn't know is that we were going to have to change about 25 legacy IT systems in order to roll out DACA. So the math didn't work. Uh, it was clearly impossible to do what he announced to the public. And of course, we, we did it because he's the president and he said so. But the, the realization that we had, uh, maybe this is obvious, uh, is that 18 months to respond to a change is, is way too long. Uh, we did it um, the wrong way. We did it, we did it <clears throat> the way that you should never do a big change like that. You know, maybe we didn't pay so much attention to security and we <laughs> wasted a lot of money and, you know, had contractors working overtime and whatever. Somehow it got done in 60 days, but the, the takeaway for us was that we need to be responsive to change. I think um, a lot of organizations see digital transformation that way. In fact, that's the, uh, that's the way I would define digital transformation, whether it's explicit or not. 
is you have organizations that have realized that they have become too slow at responding to change, and at the same time, the change is happening really fast. So um, organizations become slow, and um, this, is, this is not something to blame them for. It's very natural if you think about it, especially successful organizations that have become big. I mean, they're successful at something. They're doing something right, so it's natural to build in controls and processes that lock in whatever, whatever they've been doing that's made them successful, right? And as they get bigger and bigger, they need to somehow manage a big organization, and they tend to do that by putting bureaucracy in place that's going to keep things running even while everybody doesn't know each other, you know, it's a kind of a big spread out organization. So digital transformation uh, generally is about changing that structure, the thing that's locking in the way that they're doing things, into a better way of doing things that lets them respond to change more quickly. Uh, aha, thank you. Um, so that's been going on for a little while, and organizations have found all sorts of challenges in doing so. And then all of a sudden, a year ago or so, AI suddenly burst onto everybody's radar. And so uh, what happened pretty much was a combination of new ideas like transformer models, lots of data uh, being stored and made accessible, and then lots of compute power being made available in the cloud. And those things coming together allowed for this amazing, impressive AI stuff to happen. Um, I don't know how many of you are CIOs or in those sorts of roles, CIO, CTO. Um, but really, uh, I think for a lot of people in those kinds of roles, now all of a sudden, they didn't have time to transform, but they were being asked to transform, and now all of a sudden, AI is on top of that. You know, do AI, be generative, whatever. Um, you know, how, how can I do that? My people already had full-time jobs, and now we've been asking them to transform the organization somehow, and now well, we have to do AI as well. Um, so I, I would suggest there's, there's a different way of thinking about this, perhaps, uh, that frames it a little bit better. The idea of the digital transformation in the first place is to be able to respond to change quicker and uh, do it in a way that, that accomplishes business results creatively and in a way that responds to the change that's being sensed, whatever it is, whether the change is coming from customer, changes in customer preferences or COVID or geopolitical events or whatever it is. Um, and that includes technological change, and here we are. AI is a technological change. So if you were actually working against those objectives for transformation, that is being able to respond to change, AI is just an example of the change, right? Uh, it's, not, it's not something extra that's added on. The goal is still to be nimble and to be able to deal with change. So um, I think it's a, it's a good idea to sort of step back from this AI thing and, and think in bigger terms about what's happening with AI. And uh, the, the starting point for me is that AI, uh, generative AI, the AI that we are seeing today as the big new thing, it's not an end state. Uh, this is obvious, perhaps. Uh, it's a development in a long history of AI. Uh, there have been all sorts of machine learning before. There have been all sorts of technical leaps in machine learning. I don't know, convolutional uh, neural networks and, and things that have enabled new classes of what could be done. Um, Amazon, for example, has been using AI for things like uh, figuring out the best path for a robot to follow in the fulfillment center to uh, pick things out of the storage bins. Uh, we've been using it for the recommendation engine. We've been using it to figure out how best to pack things into a carton, 
to use as little packaging as possible. Uh, all sorts of things like that, right? These are applications that have existed for a while. Uh, and now these transformers and, and other generative techniques make a whole bunch of new things possible. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So uh, there's a history, but there's also a future. There are, there are all sorts of things that are in the lab right now uh, that presumably we're going to see at some time soon. So there are graph neural networks, there are causal models, there are all sorts of other things. So the first thing to think about is we actually, going back to digital transformation, we actually have to learn to be agile in our use of AI. We're going to need to adapt to all sorts of other things that are going to come over time. So uh, I think that's the first thing to think about. And it leads me to my next point, which is it's very tempting, and I hear a lot of people asking, it's tempting to say there's generative AI, what can we use it for? What are some use cases? And uh, I think uh, in many ways this is the wrong question. I mean, I, it's understandable why people would ask that. You want to get some idea of what the thing can do, right? Um, but I like to think about maybe early days of computing. I like really simple examples. So uh, way back, 1970s, 1980s, all of a sudden there are computers in the workplace. Um, and, and I saw it happen, you know, computers basically filled up an entire room that was air conditioned to, you know, subarctic uh, temperatures, arctic temperatures, and uh, you got these, you know, guys with white lab coats walking around and carrying reel-to-reel -reel tapes and stuff like that. Um, we had a, a guy named George who, uh, you, you couldn't really understand a word he was saying, and he slept under his desk, and he had Star Trek models on his desk and whatever. You know, it was this, this weird, thing all of a sudden. And um, if you had asked at that point, what are the use cases for computers? Uh, George, well, I, I wouldn't ask George. I'd ask somebody else probably. But uh, they probably would have said, uh, we can do a payroll system, you know, or we could print reports on this strange green and white striped paper or whatever that stuff is. Um, who would have thought that we were going to have social media and uh, uh, advertisers would pay for clicks on social media. Uh, you know, it's a, it just would have been inconceivable, right? We, we couldn't have even framed that kind of a use case at the time. Uh, yet today, computers obviously are at the center of everything everyone does. They become, they become central to every organization. But to ask in terms of use cases maybe would have missed the point then. It was more, there's this technology, it can do amazing things, and it's limited only by our ability to innovate. Uh, and that's really the point. This is a, a game of innovation. Uh, we can look at use cases, sure. You can make chatbots. Your competitors can make chatbots too. You know, we could do, we could do X and Y. But of course, everybody can do them, so there's no differentiation there. But there's this potential to do all these amazing, amazing things. And that's really the right place to focus, I believe. It's on how do you manage innovation so that you actually figure out what to do with this amazing thing that's unique to your business. So uh, a little more about what this amazing thing is. And then I want to talk about innovation and how you manage for innovation. Uh, because it's not obvious, actually. But uh, let, me, let me talk a little bit more first about what AI really is. Number one, it is something that expands the limits of what we can do with technology. I, I like, again, an, an easy example. If you think about handwritten digits and recognizing them, so if you know how to program and you try to think, you know, what would it take to write a program that can watch or look at handwritten digits and figure out what they are? Uh, it's virtually impossible, right? Yet for machine learning, this was a very easy task. Machine learning made something possible that hadn't been possible before, and I think that's the pattern here. You know, there are all these things that we would have liked to do, but it didn't even enter our heads that it could be done. But with machine learning, it expands the range of what we could do. 
And with generative AI, another big expansion with other things that are going to be coming at us, more big expansions. Uh, so that's the first observation about what this uh, AI is all about. Second observation, um, trivially obvious, machine learning is about data. Uh, this goes a little deeper than you might think. Obviously, you use data to train models, you use data to augment models uh, with proprietary data. Uh, but in a way, um, at a deeper level, machine learning really is data. What I mean is, when you train a model, that model is data. It's a bunch of parameters, you know, a billion parameters or something and the settings for those parameters, and that, that's data. So what you've really done is you've taken a bunch of training data and you've transformed it into a different state. And that state is your model. And then you're going to be able to use that model for other things. So in a very deep sense, machine learning really is data. Why do you go through the work of transforming it? Well, because once it's in this transformed state, you can use it to generate inferences, maybe to answer questions. In fact, you can use it to make your organization more agile to support your digital transformation. So now once you have your machine learning model, you can use it to answer questions and to get insights, and you don't have to know in advance what those questions are going to be. That's the agile part. So as, uh, I don't know, uh, all of a sudden COVID becomes a big thing and you have to respond, well, you can look into your data and see what it's telling you that's going to help you respond. So machine learning, AI, they're about creating or transforming data into a form that is agile in a lot of ways. In fact, machine learning being so focused on data is really almost give, sending us a message, you know, that all this work we've done to make organizations agile in the past, we've been very focused on compute and workloads, and actually we have to be focused on the data as well. Uh, so in a way, AI is really the data side of digital transformation. It's the data side of becoming agile. So uh, given that, now we want to be agile with our data. We can uh, do all sorts of creative things with it. How do we get an organization to innovate and take advantage of it? Um, so uh, another little story uh, I want to tell you. So I was in the government, and my agency had this amazing IT project going on. Uh, it was amazing because it was such a failure at such huge scope. Um, I didn't even, when I joined the government, I didn't even understand how you could spend $1 billion on a software development project. But we could do it. Uh, not only could we do that, but we could actually waste the billion dollars and not get any result from it. So this was a very famous kind of failing project in the government. Uh, and as the Trump administration was coming in, um, they realized that somebody might get blamed and get in trouble for the fact that we'd wasted a billion dollars. So they put me in charge of the project. That's basically what it, you, you've got it now, okay. Um, and so uh, before it had been run by a separate program office outside of IT. And uh, so I started by talking to the people who were leading the project. And uh, I sat each of them down and I, I said, what, what, should we, what should we be doing differently? You know, you've been in the middle of this. How can we avoid wasting money like this? And amazingly, each of them gave me a great answer. And they were really innovative answers. One of them said, uh, you know, we're taking a paper process. We're trying to make it electronic, but we're not changing the process. And if we really thought about it, we should change it this way and this way. And somebody else said, we're not really talking to the people who are going to be using it, but what, if we talk to them, I bet this is what they would say, and here's what we could do. Um, so each person had all these wonderful, innovative ideas. And uh, so I asked them, of course, well, you've been in charge of the project. Why haven't you been doing these things? And 
mean, that's kind of an obvious question, right? Uh, the answer uh, surprised me a little. Uh, the answer was, Mark, do you know how hard it is to get approval for any new ideas around here? And we counted, and there are 17 people who can say no to any of our ideas. And by the way, Mark, you're one of them. OK. Uh, maybe there is a learning there for me. Uh, I, I thought about it. And what I realized is when somebody in an organization comes to you as their manager with an innovative idea, what do you do? Well, first thing you do is you start to ask questions. You say, uh, well, have you thought about this? And have you thought about that? And uh, did you talk to this person? Uh, did you talk to this other person? Are you sure that this is going to work? And this, you know, basically, it's, it's a negative response to innovative ideas. And of course, this is the worst way to encourage innovation. In fact, it builds a culture of not innovating. Why do we do it? Uh, we do it because, well, we're managers. We know what can go wrong. And we have to make sure we manage risk for the company or the, the government agency in this case. Um, so it's a very natural way to manage. Um, and it made sense in a way as long as innovation was risky and expensive. So the question is, is innovation risky and expensive now? And I think the, the answer that we found is that we could actually lower the risk of trying out innovative ideas so much that we didn't have to assume this posture of interrogating somebody who had a good idea, basically. Um, so the cloud played a big part in this. Uh, we, we moved to the cloud very quickly as we, as we started to change course. Uh, the reason why the cloud helps mitigate risk is, well, a lot of reasons. But one is um, you can spin up infrastructure, use it a little bit. If what you're trying to do doesn't work out, you just get rid of the infrastructure and you stop paying for it, right? So you, you can back out of anything uh, without a cost. If you make a mistake in deciding what infrastructure you want to use, well, just change it. Uh, stop paying for the old, start paying for the new. Um, if you want to get access to machine learning services, in the old days, maybe you would have had to hire the, the army of PhDs, let them work for a couple of years on expensive hardware to create um, a model that might or might not work for you. Heavy risk, right? You're investing a whole bunch. In the cloud, you can acquire as building blocks machine learning services analytics, IoT, uh, augmented reality, virtual, all, all of these things, emerging technologies that you might want to innovate with. And you pay for what you use, which means that as you're trying out innovations, as you're experimenting with them, you're spending very little because you're not using it at scale. Later on, your costs are going to go up, of course, as your volume goes up. And then maybe that means your revenues are going up or your costs, costs are going down. But basically, the idea is to take the risk in an innovation, which is typically the upfront investment before it proves itself out, and eliminate that upfront component or reduce it greatly so that you can try out a lot more ideas. So how does that change the way that you manage? Well, I found, at least, it puts me in the position of a coach more than a risk manager. Uh, so when an employee comes to me with a brilliant idea, I can say, cool, how would we test that out? Uh, what can we do that is low risk and fast to see if it's going to be useful to us or helpful uh, or accomplish the business goal? And how will we know if it's a good idea? So in other words, I'm coaching the employee on how to do a fast experiment that will validate their idea or show that it's not a great idea. And it might be that I'm wrong about the fact that they have a terrible idea. Go ahead, prove it to me. Uh, so risk posture influences your ability to innovate in a big way. I think uh, as we look at generative AI, 
this uh, similar mechanism is at play here because with generative AI, usually, we're using a model that's provided by a third party. So somebody else is developing the foundation model, the LLM or the, the image diffusion model or whatever it is, and we can just use that model. In other words, we didn't have to invest in creating the model. So a lot of that upfront risk is gone, and we can use the already available foundation model to conduct small-scale experiments to try to prove out ideas using AI. So uh, at AWS, what we've tried to do is make those foundation models available through a common API, a common set of services, so that it's easy to um, try out those experiments, and then if they're successful, move to production from there. So uh, back to the subject of digital transformation, to wrap it up, um, I'm going to actually define agility for you. I know everybody avoids this question, but I, I'm willing to stick my neck out. We're shooting for agility here. And agility is the ability to respond to change quickly, cheaply, creatively, and at low risk. OK, respond to change in the environment uh, or in the company quickly, cheaply, creatively, at low risk. So. Uh, AI plays into this because it gives us a way to respond uh, quickly once we've built the capabilities through our models, uh, to respond inexpensively and at low risk by being able to use foundation models, the cloud, and all, all these other techniques, and then creatively in the sense that we can innovate we can innovate because our risks are low, and uh, we can engage the entire organization in innovation. So really, when you think about the relationship, AI isn't something that's added on to the burden of transformation. I hope it's not a burden, but the, uh, the work, let's say, of transformation. Uh, it's not something that's added on. It's something that completes the picture of what transformation is about. It helps us make our data agile so that we can use it to answer questions as we need to. It helps us uh, innovate and respond creatively to new business situations that arise. And it's something that we have to treat in an agile way because it's going to keep changing rather than saying, uh, here's a snapshot today of what AI can do. Let's uh, see how we can use that. No, actually, what we have to do is think of the future change happening in the world of AI, as, as well as other emerging technologies, quantum computing, you know, whatever it is that's going to come at us, we don't know. Uh, but if we've done the right things with both data and compute, then we're ready for those things as they happen. So to be successful with AI, you need to find ways, I think, to use it agilely, to make it part of an overall data strategy that culminates in having these models, which are data too, that you can use to support your business. You need to be able to get your organization to innovate. Some people say democratizing it. Uh, I say engaging the entire organization in order to be able to innovate. Uh, and you need to find ways to include the AI in your business processes to serve customers rather, or to, to generate business value, let's say rather than just focusing on what use cases are out there and what can we do with the thing. So uh, I hope that, that sort of helps uh, wrap up into a neat package a lot of the things that the panelists said, because as they were talking, I was thinking, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I mean. Uh, and uh, good luck to all of you on your journeys. Uh, thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.